वसुदेवसुतम देव कंसचाणूरमर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्ण वंदे जगद्गु So we're studying the Bhagavad Gita in these Friday classes, and um, we were on chapter eight. So let me just a little bit of a background. You know, one I remember we had a teacher who used to teach us statistics, what what's now called data science it used to be called statistics at that time, and we'd had these long mathematical derivations. If you would. Uh, you know this implies this this implies this and go on and fill up the blackboard and we stopped for summer vacations long derivation was going on and after two months he comes on the first class after two months he enters the classroom and then he writes on the blackboard implies and then he goes on with the wherever he had, where he had left off the derivation two months ago so obviously everybody has forgotten what was going on let's have a little background bhagavad gita we know 18 chapters 700 verses and it is a moksha shastra um, yesterday i was talking to a, a very well known intellectual philosopher he was saying that uh, i'm going to give this talk uh, about how unmanageable human nature is and all these you know the this gita for management uh, this is this is not right because gita is not a management book uh, it's it's a moksha shastra it is a, a a text which tells us how to attain enlightenment how to attain freedom spiritual freedom go beyond suffering uh, attain the purpose of life however um, in defense of those who use bhagavad gita for management or for many other things for uh, um, you know healthy living or what not it's not true that uh, gita is a book for management or for diet or for whatever all but it is full of insights which can be useful so it is not totally invalid to use bhagavad gita for purposes other than enlightenment uh, but one must never forget lose sight of the fact um, what is the central purpose of bhagavad gita i remember uh, there was a gita class at harvard university and there were people from the kennedy school of government they had come to learn about what was the ancient indian view of warfare the politics of warfare i said you'll be sorely disappointed because you might think the bhagavad gita is set in the mahabharata uh, and in the midst of uh, on, on a battlefield that's the setting so there will be discussion about what there isn't it starts off in the first chapter with a consideration uh, of uh, the pros and cons of engaging in war and then the whole thing you know sort of fades out to the background and there is a discussion about what is the self what is god what is devotion devotion what are spiritual practices and so on moral virtues and so on because it's a moksha shastra it's not a text on governance it's not a text on war it's not a text on management it's not a text on healthy living but you can get a lot of insights from this and you can apply it in different fields that's there's no doubt primarily a text for enlightenment god realization in these 18 chapters 700 verses divided into 18 chapters one way of reading it Uh, and a pretty accepted way in classical interpretations of the bhagavad gita is to see it uh, as divided into three sections of six chapters each from chapter 1 to 6 7 to 12 and 13 to 18 and how do you divide this the great vedantic saying tatvamasi that thou art you are that ultimate reality you the individual being that ultimate reality and how are you that ultimate reality that identity so these are the three sections the first physics six chapters tells us about you i who am i i know what i am right now but an investigation into what we really are the claim is we do not know ourselves as we truly are and it's really really worthwhile it's the most worthwhile endeavor um, search in our life to find out who or what we are um you know this inquiry atma vichara inquiry into oneself this is the direct route the direct path to enlightenment most famously ramana maharshi in our modern age he would teach uh, who am i find out who you are who am i and he would teach it to one and all so 
So a group of people who were obviously devotees, they came to him and asked us, what is the way to attain enlightenment? And he said, do which are inquiry, find out who am I. Then when the news of this went to another saintly person uh, who, who was told that these people, these particular group, uh, this had gone to Ramana Maharshi and Ramana Maharshi gave the same advice which he gives everybody. So this other person who was also a saint, I won't take the name, he said, well, if they had come to me, I wouldn't have said that. I would have told them to do Japa, to repeat the name of God. They are not uh, qualified, ripe enough for self-inquiry. Now, this was again repeated back to Ramana Maharshi. So you can see that even the highest spiritual levels, there's gossip. This is repeated back to Ramana Maharshi. You told these people uh, who are obviously uh, uh, quite ordinary folk with a simple devotion to God, you told them to practice self-inquiry. Who am I? Whereas that saint said, they are not fit for this. It's no use telling them all these things. Um, they have to do japa and have devotion to God. Ramana Maharshi said, is not wrong, but I gave an honest answer. They asked me a question. What is the direct, the shortest way to God realization, enlightenment? And I told them the honest answer. The honest answer is this. Now, so, and he stopped. He didn't explain any further. Honest answer is this, that self, self-realization. Who, find out who you are. Of course, he does not say that um, these, those people will be able to do it and become enlightened. Or not. But straight question, straight answer is this. And it won't do them any harm if they, if they try. So anyway, the first six chapters deal with self-inquiry. Uh, inquiry into who am I? And Krishna teaches Arjuna that you are not the body, not the mind. You are the Atman, immortal consciousness, not the object, the pure subject, not subject to birth and death, not subject to um, old age, disease, aging, uh, I mean uh, death, not subject to the sorrows and miseries and depressions and uh, the limitations of the mind. Remember, he does not say old age, misery and death are not there. They are there. The body will become old and it will become diseased and it will die. The mind will be subject to ups and downs. However, if you know who you are, uh, at least at the level of the mind, you will attain some peace. You will attain the ability to transcend these uh, the buffets of, of life. Then comes the next six chapters, where we are now, from chapter 7 onwards. The focus shifts from the inquiry of the self to the inquiry of God. Um, who is God? What is God like? And how do you cultivate? You have to set up an, a relationship to, with God. With yourself, you don't have a relationship. You, uh, it's identity. You know who you are. I, I did not know who I am. After inquiry, now I know who I am. With God, after we hear about God, we are taught about God in our religions, we set up a relationship. Yeah. The Lord is my master, I am the servant. The Lord is my friend, I am the friend of the Lord. The Lord is my father or mother, uh, and I am the child. Or the other way around, the Lord is my child, so on. Um, so the chapters 7 to, 13, to 12 are about devotion. And we are there in chapter 8. So the chapter is about God and it's about devotion to God. Goal is still the same. God realization, enlightenment and moksha, liberation from sorrow. And then from chapter 13 to uh, 18, again, the, the approach will shift. It will ba be back to knowledge, to jnana and the I great identity. This is a broad picture. Don't come to me by saying that uh, in, the, in the second chapter also, we had lots of other things. Apart from self-knowledge, we, we were taught karma yoga. And then in another chapter, we were taught about the avatara and devotion to avatara. True. It's just a broad picture. Each of these chapters contains a lot more. Now, eighth chapter, all this was to say the eighth chapter, you will should not be surprised when it is, you find it is overwhelmingly about God. Because it's in the middle sixth, sixth uh, middle third of the, um, of the divisions of the 18 chapters. What is there in the 8th chapter? What have we seen so far? And the 8th chapter starts with Arjuna asking 7 questions. He asks, what is Adhyatma? I'll explain. Adhyatma, what is Adhibhuta? What is Adhidaiva? What is Adhiyagya? Um, and then uh, what is 
karma, what is Brahman, and what is, um, uh, what is, how do you remember God at the time of death and what's the point of that and how, why should you do that? That seventh question is actually the theme, the, the central thing about this, you know, take away from this chapter. Thinking about God, loving God, and holding on to God, specifically at the time of death also. Um, throughout your life, but specifically at the time of death. But before that, all these other check, uh, these questions, seven questions, the first six questions, technical terms, all of them, Adhyatma, Adhidaiva, Adhibhautika, what do they mean? And why, why is he asking all this? All of these are there because Krishna referred to them at the end of the seventh chapter. So he sort of instigated Arjuna to ask these questions. And I will not go into the details of that. Basically, it's an outline of Vedanta. Adhyatma means our inner spiritual reality. And Krishna says our inner spiritual reality is pure consciousness. Uh, he answers the first six chap uh, questions in brief. Just brief, straight answers uh, within one or two verses. Uh, wh what is uh, Adibhuta? That means this physical universe. He says it's made of five elements. Um, Panchabhuta. It is material. What is... Uh, um, uh, uh, Adhi Daiva, he says, it is uh, the cosmic mind, Hiranyagarbha, all our minds together. Uh, and then uh, what is uh, Adhi Yajna, the, literally it means what is the spiritual reality to which all religious rituals are offered, you know, all devotional practices, specifically the Vedic rituals. And he says it's God, Ishwara. Uh, Ishwara is Adhi Yajna. All all sacrifices are given to God. What, what was this discussion? What was it all about? Notice, if you carefully follow what Krishna has done here, he has referred to Virat, Hiranyagarbha, Ishwara. <laughs> the Vedantic idea of the cosmos, of, of the divine behind this cosmos. Consciousness with this entire physical universe. That is Virat. Consciousness with all our minds together, the cosmic mind, that is Hiranyagarbha. And consciousness, which is the, the power of Maya, which, why is it called Adhiyagya? Because it is the one which gives the results of, uh, of the sacrifices. It's the one which gives the results of all karma, the master of karma. All karma is administered by God. So Ishwara is Adhiyagya. And then he talks of what is Brahman. Very quickly, he touches upon the same idea of Brahman. And karma, um, which propels us from birth to birth and which is a, constitutes a bondage, that's what keeps us as individual beings. All of that, just quickly. And then he says, those who think of God, those who hold on to God, uh, they will be uh, freed at the end of their lives. Um, and so you, one must think of God at the point of death. One must be, have this devotional attitude at the point of the death of this physical body. But how do you do that? He says, for, to do that, you have to have devotion um, you know, throughout your life. So this, at least the practice of devotion throughout your life, the predominant thought and love of God throughout life has to be cultivated. A question might arise that what happens after death, you know, God will, come, will help us at the point of death if we take refuge in God at the time of death. But then what about karma? Yes, but um, you know, all the good karma, the results will be given, they will be activated if you take refuge in, in, in God. So it's a very powerful thing to do. Most powerful thing to do at the point of death is to take refuge in God. That's why in um, all religious traditions, which are theistic religious traditions, there's an importance of being especially prayerful and devotional at the point of death. And Krishna makes the point that you cannot do it at the point of death, unless you have done it throughout your life. Um, why just at the point of death? It is difficult at the at, in old age also. If one has not practiced, then it's difficult to make these changes in old age. It's better to practice from when, begin practicing when you are young. Now, what else is there in this chapter? Uh, he says, Krishna says, that those um, who Worship God for worldly and otherworldly desires. I want a good life in this world, happy, prosperous, things will go my way. And I want to go to heaven and have a nice life after death. 
they will attain that um, by the by the worship of god but that's a very worldly uh, way they, they will not attain enlightenment they will not get freedom from samsara they will again come back but they will just accumulate good karma by the worship of god and performing religious rituals vedic rituals with desire with the desire for a good but limited worldly and other worldly existence have a nice life here and go to heaven after death but those who do not do that also um so they um will be subject to their past karma and they'll be born and they will con- die and be born again and die as their past karma um, you know they caught in the stream of the effects of their past karma and there is a, th- a third category of those who are very spiritual very devoted to god have not yet attained enlightenment what will happen to them at the point of death they will uh, be by the grace of god they will go to god and live in that highest heaven called brahma loka which is basically the heaven of all the theistic religions which is what the vaishnavas mean by vaikuntha uh, the um, jews christians muslims mean by heaven um, by um, you know so there is a realm a kind of existence which is not worldly which is actually spiritual and where you dwell in the presence of god what about enlightenment you will get enlightenment there and you will be free so that is called krama mukti sequential liberation and so so you have these um four options what happens after death one is the majority of all sentient beings they are they are swept along by their past karma new births new lives a mixture of misery and pleasure mostly misery and it goes on this is a cycle of birth and death this is called samsara without end those then there are those little better than that who are moral who are devotional have faith in god have performed some kind of prayer rituals technically it, it would mean the vedic ritualism but you can more, more liberally you can open it up to include all sorts of devotions in different religions all sorts of re- religious ritualistic practices why do they do that they want to hold on to god and uh, have a good life here and um, go to heaven and have a good life in heaven afterwards so that's the second kind who will um, who will have still be in samsara but have a relatively better samsara they will go to heaven on the merit of their past good karma when that past good karma is exhausted they will again come back to this worldly existence but they will not get into animal births or lower births they will get human births and good human births and they born in maybe prosperous and good families and get an opportunity for uh, you know spiritual development also so that's the third option um, who are uh, who are what do you call um, who, who no the, is is the third or the uh, no this is this is, this is a, a second option the second option those who perform religious rituals with the desire for good life here and good life in the in the future the third option is that those who do not want samsara they want god realization and they have intense devotion to god in some form uh, through meditation japa Um, through puja or in some kind of devotional practice and sincerely they don't want uh, samsaric existence either in this life or again in in future so what will happen to them after death they will go to brahma loka to the heaven of religions that means the highest heaven remember there is a gradation of heavens also uh, so the highest heaven is a spiritual heaven it's not a worldly or other worldly place it is a place where you dwell in the presence of god and ultimately get liberation and freedom from there in vedanta it is called brahma loka and then there is the fourth one the highest of all who gets enlightenment here and now in this life you realize you are brahman game is over for you you are jivan mukta in this very life and after death you are videha mukta liberated while living as long as your body continues and bodiless liberation after the death of the body so that's the highest four options 
born and dying, swept along by karma, worst. Anything can happen depending on our past karma. Little better than that, holding on to God, but with worldly desires and other worldly desires. Still have a little better kind of worldly existence and other worldly existence. Still samsara. Third, uh, even better, has dispassion for the world, genuine devotion, wants only God and yet for some reason has not attained enlightenment in this life, will go to God after death, will not come back. So that person is in a sense technically has attained moksha because not reborn anymore, uh, lives in, in the presence of God. So all the dualistic religions, all the uh, you know, different dualistic schools of Vedanta, for example, who say that our goal is not that I am, I am Brahman, realize that. And, no, no, our goal is to go to heaven and stay in the presence of God whether it is, you think of it as Shiva or Vishnu or Devi or whatever, um, they will. And they will not be born again in this world. They are liberated. But they have not got moksha and they have not uh, attained enlightenment yet. There they will attain enlightenment. That's from an Advaitic perspective. The dualistic religions might say we don't care. <laughs> we just want to live in the proximity of our beloved Lord. That's it. And the fourth one, last one, is the one who realizes I am Brahman. This is what uh, he will, has discussed and will discuss a uh, little later. And the final topic which he has touched upon before we move on is the entire universe. Brahman, that is God, the personal God, the Saguna Brahman, with the power of Maya from the unmanifest projects this, pro this manifest universe. And the universe li lasts for billions of years and again goes back into the unmanifest. Uh, disappears again and again it's projected so there's a cycle of projection and reversal um, a lot like we wake go about our business in the waking world and then we fall asleep and dream and go to deep sleep so in the same way from an Ishwara's perspective from unmanifest maya this universe comes into manifestation exists for billions of years all the drama of this universe and life goes on and then again is absorbed back into the Maya of Ishwara, and this cycle goes on. The last verse we did, the 20th verse before we closed, the 20th verse of the 8th chapter, it was said, other than this unmanifest, this entire universe goes back into, it comes from an unmanifested state, and then um, exists for a while, and then goes back into an unmanifested state. Recently, there was an article um, creation of this, you know something from nothing, and I, I read it. So, so some scientists have uh, created tiny particles of matter from quote unquote nothing. So not nothing. If you see what that nothing is, it's a pretty complex, <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of complex physics behind it. There are fields. There's something called quantum form and whatnot. So that's clearly not nothing. It just seems like nothing from our gross perspective. That that's called the unmanifest. From the unmanifest comes the manifest universe, and then the manifest universe again goes back to the unmanifest. Creation, existence, destruction. Srishti, Stiti, Pralaya. In the 20th verse, however, Krishna says, beyond this unmanifest, beyond this Maya, there is another unmanifest, a greater unmanifest, which is Brahman, which is higher than Maya, which is the ultimate reality of the universe, Brahman itself. So that was the verse which we did. 20th verse. Parastasmatu bhavanyo abhyakto abhyakta sanatana yasa sarveshu bhuteshu nashyat suna vinashyati. So beyond this unmanifest from which the universe has come, into which it will go again, beyond this there is another unmanifest, abhyakta. What is that abhyakta? Paraha, it is transcendent. It is Brahman, existence, consciousness, bliss. It is the absolute reality. Even Maya is not the absolute reality. Sanatana, it is eternal. So Maya is also eternal, but a changing eternal. This Brahman is, is an unchanging or an absolute eternal. It's beyond concepts of change and changelessness, actually. But anyway, compared to Maya, compared to this universe, Brahman is unchanging. Um, Maya is also eternal, but it's a flow like a river. A river goes on, but every moment it's different. 
Similarly, this creation, this universe, it is there all the time. Sometimes in this form, sometimes disappears back into Maya, but it is continuously changing. Brahman is not like that, Sanatana, eternal. Um, he says, Bhavanya, a reality. There is another reality, quite distinct from Maya. Maya is object. Brahman is pure subject. Maya is something that you can still experience. How do we experience Maya? Well, we experience it all the time in our deep sleep. The, the potential blankness of deep sleep from which emerges all our dreams and our waking experience. We experience it all the time as ignorance. I do not know that veiling power. Especially I do not know myself, my real nature. He says, Swami, I know myself. Yes, but after we read Vedanta, after we read Gita, Upanishads and all, then we are forced to say, oh, so this is what I am, Satchidanan. This I don't know. I don't know really. I mean, I read about it, but it doesn't, it's not clear to me. That's Maya. That's the veiling power of Maya. So we experience, so Maya is experienced. Not as, uh, an ob, not as uh, something that you see or hear or smell or taste or touch, but as um, the seed of all of this. Not only that, that Maya undergoes changes. It, it now emerges as dreams. Then it emerges as this entire physical universe. But Brahman is not seen in that way, not as an object. And nor does it undergo any change. So Anyaha, different, different. This unmanifest Maya and that unmanifest Brahman, the ultimate reality, they are different. They are not the same. Although we are using, so why are you calling it unmanifest? Are you calling both of them Abhyakta unmanifest? Because None of them are available to, um, uh, you know, sensory experience. Even the maya in its original state, you can't see it or hear it or smell it or taste it or touch it. It is prior to all sensory experience. The physical manifestation of maya, you can see, hear, smell, taste, touch. You can think about it. You can do art, religion, science, politics, all of that in the physical manifestation of maya. But when it goes to unmanifest state, maya in its real nature, I mean, Maya as unmanifest, then you cannot, um, you know, it, it's not an object to your senses, nor can you really think about it. It is unthinkable. It's, it's something incredible and far more incredible than Brahman itself. <laughs> so that story is there when, um, you know, Narada asks Vishnu, show me your Maya. And then that story is there. Many of us, we know it. How... Um, Vishnu says, no, ask something else. Now this is, no, no, I want to know Maya, what Maya is. And then Vishnu says, all right, you asked for it. <laughs> and then he says, well, uh, can you get me a glass of water? I'm a little tired. They're out for a walk. All right, God and, and the sage are out for a walk. And God is thirsty. And so Narada says, uh, immediately, I'll, I'll just bring it. And he goes to this village well to get some water for Vishnu. And then... Um, in some stories it is Krishna, but in some stories it is Vishnu. So and then he sees this girl drawing water at the well and he falls in love with her. He goes with her to her house and asks for her hand to her uh, in marriage to her father. And then they get married and then um, it's completely forgotten that Vishnu is waiting for water. And then they settle down and um, the father leaves his property to his uh, daughter and son-in-law. And children are, three children are born to them. They are very busy and very happening life, as you would say today. So uh, once a flood comes and washes away the village late at night, one, one night, and um, uh, Narada desperately tries to save his uh, property, his children, his wife, and clutches hold of his uh, children you know, two, on one hand to two, two children, one child on his shoulder. So graphic description, one hand clutching his wife and desperately struggling against the flood waters in the dead of the night, then the children get swept away, and then his wife gets swept away by the flood waters, in spite of his best efforts, and is thrown weeping and wailing on the bank of the river. And then he sees a quiet voice that uh, he hears a quiet voice. That, Narada, where is my water? You have been gone quite the half hour. And he looks and he can see and Vishnu's feet, maybe in sandals. And when he looks and looks up and sees Vishnu looking down at him. There is no river, there is no village, no flood, nothing. It's bright, shining daylight. 
Vishnu says to him, and this is Maya. Um, but then this is our life. This is exactly what we experience as life. And notice something, something that can develop over years, a story, a narrative. It gets married, meets the girl, gets married. There, is, there are places, people, there's work to be done. There is the farm to be taken care of, their children to um, you know, uh, raise. Uh, and all of it can be destroyed in you know, one night. Everything can get swept up and it does. And then it's gone forever. And then you don't know <laughs> what was that, what was all that. Uh, recently, David Chalmers in his book, Reality Plus, he has used this story uh, to describe what virtual reality could be like. And he has a cartoon of Vishnu and Narada there in that book also. So this is, this is Maya. And we experience this Maya. Um, and there's that very stirring story of a devotee who asked Swami Vivekananda, one of Swami Vivekananda's disciples, he said, I have Vivekananda once was very pleased with him in Belur Mat, uh, in Calcutta, and said, ask me for anything. And this devotee, he said, young man, tell me what is Maya. I want to understand Maya. Vivekananda said, ask something else. Quite a lot like Vishnu. And the devotee said, no. He said, and his own reminiscences he has written. He said, I asked Vivekananda, I said, with a teacher like you, if I don't understand this, I'll never understand it uh, ever again. So then Vivekananda started talking. And uh, that gentleman, he says that as Vivekananda spoke, my mind was raised to a very high plane. I found the world, the room and the cot and everything around, whirling around doors and windows, whirling and disappearing into a void and into a vast mass of luminosity. I could still hear Vivekananda's voice though. And then I exclaimed that, then all this is Maya, even what you are doing. The Ramakrishna Mart and Mission and all these ashrams, all of it is Maya then. And uh, Vivekananda smiled and said, and Vivekananda said, the voice said that, you are right. Merge yourself in Brahman, in meditation and realize all this and be free. Or if you cannot, then come here and help me in this work. Now, this gentleman says that I addressed Vivekananda in, in, you know, in Bengali, Indian languages, you have apni to me. So apni is like you address somebody senior to you, uh, somebody like your parents or your guru or somebody is apni. In Hindi, it would be ap. To me, is something that you do for people who are uh, your age or equals. And so this person, he, this man, he said, I suddenly realized to my horror, I had addressed Vivekananda as to me. You don't do that to your guru. The moment I realized that, in the sense of difference, Hierarchy comes into his mind. Suddenly the whole world snaps back. And he sees Vivekananda sitting on the cot and looking down at him and smiling. Um, if you're interested in knowing, you know, we want to know then what, did, what is it that Vivekananda said to this, this person to give him this realization. So he has not mentioned that. But, you know, Vivekananda gave three lectures on Maya. So if you want to get a sense of what he might have said, you have to see the, read those lectures. Anyway, so quite apart from Maya is this Brahman, which is existence itself, not a changing thing like Maya, which is consciousness itself, not an object to consciousness, which is bliss and fulfillment itself, not a mixture of pleasure and pain like Maya is. So this is how Brahman is different. This unmanifest is different. Where is Brahman? Where is Brahman? Your Sarveshu Bhuteshu. In all beings, in all human beings, in all living animals, in plants, in non living things, in all beings, in all existences, in, this, in, in the tiny and in the vast, in the near and in the far, uh, in physically, externally, and internally in our minds and thoughts and feelings. In all things, Brahman is there. Where is Brahman? Here, here. We have heard it again and again. Even learned people, scholarly people who studied Vedanta, they make a mistake. You know, sometimes people say, when talking about Vedanta, oh, Vedanta says, see, Brahman is the only reality. The world is false. And so all of this, you know, this is false. And Brahman is the reality. No, 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 you're making a big mistake. But that's what Shankara said. Brahman is real, world is false. This is the world, it's false. Brahman is real. 
There's something called Brahman. Maybe then you access it in deep meditation or something. No, no, no. Look carefully. What is Krishna saying? What is Shankara himself saying? Where is Brahman? When you say a world is false, true. But when you say this is the world, it's false. But what, when you say this is the world, this is Brahman plus world. If you say this is false and there is some other Brahman, you have thrown out the baby with the bath water. It's like saying the gold is the reality. It's not the necklace or the, or the bracelet or the ring is not the reality. The ornaments are not the reality. It's gold. Oh, all right. Then I'll throw the ornaments away. I'll look for gold. You'll never find it. Then please teach me where to find the gold. In every golden ornament, there is gold. In everything that exists, there's Brahman. Because Brahman is existence. It's pure being. In every conscious experience, every experience, there is Brahman. Because Brahman is consciousness. Without consciousness, no experience. So this Sat Chit. And every movement for happiness, fulfillment, the striving you see all around you. The spiritual striving, non-spiritual striving, everything. This vast movement going on in this samsara. This is the striving is towards ananda. And Brahman is this ananda. Where is it? Here, here, here. So people make a mistake. Don't be mistaken about it. You are immersed in Brahman. You are in an ocean of Brahman. You don't see it. It's like a fish in the ocean does not know what water is. We are right here, right now. We are immersed in God all the time. How do you then distinguish Brahman from not Brahman? Nashyatsu Navinashyati is the next. Notice one thing about the world. It changes. We have already said Maya and its products are continuously changing. Is, somebody might ask a Vedanta scholar, but Maya is not changing, its products are changing. No, Maya itself is dynamic. It is composed of Sattva, Rajas, Tamas. And those Sattva, Rajas, Tamas, are, they are in, sometimes they are in equilibrium. And that is the state of Pralaya, cosmic dissolution. And other times they are active, one changing into the other. And that creates this universe. So that's Sankhyan cosmology. Basic point is Maya is continuously changing. Products of Maya are continuously changing. In all this change, there is a background of no change. There is one thing that does not change. But something, uh, note this carefully. When we say Brahman is in this world, it does not mean Brahman is contained in this world. Like say, if you have a bowl and you have got um, uh, peas or uh, fruit or you know apples in a bowl. It's not like the world is a bowl and in that Brahman is kept. Not like that. It's not like a cupboard in which many items are stored, so one item is Brahman. Not like that. It's not like the body in which there are many organs, brain and heart, like that one, one more thing is Brahman. Not like that. Brahman is not, the ultimate reality is not one type of reality, one existing thing among many existing things. No, it is the very existence of all of them. It is also not, when you say it's the... In all destructible things, there's the undestruct, indestructible, the, the non-changing. It is also not, don't think of it as, oh, so it's like a compound in which everything is changing, but one part is not changing. Not like that. One good example would be a movie. So everything in the movie is changing. The movie itself changes. And the movie is finished, another movie starts. And everything in the movie is changing. But the screen is not changing. But the screen is not a character in the movie. Is not an item, is not a part of the script of the movie, right? Uh, but it is the reality of all movies. Similarly, being or existence here everywhere. Uh, and you can notice it in every experience, in everything in this world, living and non living. So that is Brahman and that is what you are. Now, we go on into 21st verse. Abhyakto Aksharait Yukta. Tamahu paramam gatim yam prapya na nivartante taddhama paramam mama. That unmanifest, this is Brahman, which is called the imperishable, is said to be the supreme goal, attaining which they return not. That is my supreme abode or state. The point here is all this metaphysics is fine. Why should we care? The answer is you should care because it's a solution to all your problems. You should care because this is the answer to all your questions. I often say, 
In Advaita Vedanta, there is one answer to all questions, one solution to all problems. This is an important thing to note because, especially these days, it is fashionable. Give me some practice for a little peace of mind. Give me some practice for, can you give me a, some practice for a little uh, you know, managing stress or practice for developing compassion for others or practice for um, this and that. So I'm often asked to give a talk on Hinduism or Vedanta. And so now it's, it's part of the academic curriculum, you know. So, so, so Swami, at the end of the class, can you add one, can you show us one practice? See, Advaita Vedanta is not about a bunch of isolated practices. Even Buddhism isn't. It's often Buddhism which is taught as a, a few practices for mindfulness, a few practices for uh, calmness, a few practices for developing compassion. No, 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 no. Buddha also had one central insight which he wanted to share. And then you can have lots of other practices. So, uh, it's the, the problem of the modern secular approach is to, to dismiss the central insight and then mine the resources of religion for something that can give a little bit of secular help in this world. A little peace of mind, little stress busting, little boosting the immune system or um, handling the wrinkles in the face little better interpersonal relationships, a little more ecological approach, all those things you can do. But it's a very secular way of looking at spirituality because you are ignoring the essential, the core teaching of spirituality. In all meditation, the core teaching, in, in, say, in, say at least in yoga, is that there is something beyond the mind that has to be realized. In all devotional practices, in all theistic religions, the core teaching, quite apart from this practice and that practice, the core teaching, God exists and you have to have a loving relationship with God. That's the core teaching. In Advaita Vedanta, the core teaching, you are that. You are Brahman. That's the core teaching. Uh, not uh, you know, discrete, uh, little, in Bengali you say kuchro. It means... Um, I don't know how to translate that into English. Uh, scattered practices, little practices here and there. I have learned 20 ni nice practices. You might, and they might improve your day-to-day -day life a little bit. But that's not the point of uh, spirituality. So he said, what's the point of spirituality? Yam prapya na nivartante. This is the ultimate goal of all life, attaining which you have fulfilled the purpose of life. The goal of life is attained from which you do not come back into nivartanti, you do not come back. Come back where? Come back to death. Come back to misery and limited existence, limitations of sorrow and uh, striving and frustration, never attaining fulfillment. That limitation is gone forever. You attain, but for that, one goes beyond this uh, limited body-mind. Limited body-mind will continue as long as life is there. But even after the death of the body-mind, nothing is lost. You remain as this unlimited ocean of existence. So never come back into limitation again. Yang prapya no nivartante. That's the goal. It's not one little goal among many goals. It is the goal for which all other goals are subsidiaries. Whatever we are trying to do in life, whatever we are trying to do in spiritual life is this. Whatever we are trying to do in any life, secular life also, in art, religion, science, in war, in criminality, in hatred, in fights and quarrels, in love, in desire, in all of that, whatever we are trying to do is, is ultimately this. We just don't know it. This is what, what is the point of it all. It's the entire game that is going on. And tad dhama paramam mama. What is that you attain? You attain my real nature. My transcendent nature, which is existence consciousness, which you are. Paramam Gatim. This is the ultimate goal of all existence, of all life, of a human life, definitely, and of all life. It's the goal of all spirituality. It's the goal of Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta. It's the goal of all spirituality. It's the goal of all life also. Then, um, 22. Purusha Sapara Partha. No, sorry, is that it? Yes. Purusha Sapara Partha. 
ಭಕ್ತ್ಯಾಲಭ್ಯಸ್ತು ಅನನ್ಯ ಯಸ್ಯಾಂತಸ್ಥಾನಿಭೂತಾನಿ ಯೇನ ಸರ್ವಂಮಿದಂ ತತ great i want to do this how do you attain it he says that supreme being o partha in whom are all beings and by whom all this is pervaded is attainable by one pointed devotion and ah now you non dualists are caught but wait remember this is the section on god and devotion from chapter 7 to 12 so he says o partha o arjuna that reality you want to attain that yes of course we have advertised it enough it sounds great i want to i want to get that how how tell me how bhaktya by devotion by love by adoration by worship faith worship devotion adoration surrender continuously dwelling in god what kind of devotion ananyaya there is no second anymore the one and only one thing in our life is god i love the lord my god in whichever form you love in whichever way you understand god uh, with nothing else everything else yes other people whatever is there in life everything i love through in and through god not as i love god plus so many other things no only god ananya without a second now if you see shankaracharya's commentary you will you will smile he says by devotion so what would shankara say to this the great non dualist he is quite brazen here he says devotion what is devotion it is the knowledge what is what knowledge the knowledge of the self i am brahman <laughs> what do you mean this is clearly it's devotion love of god is being talked about and you don't seem to be budging from your self knowledge aham brahmasmi but he says ananya non dual without a second there is only one without a second that is brahman and devotion to that would mean you know, uh, focus on that without anything else so this word ananya ananya or ananya not no second there's no other it means the love for in which there is no other thing except god only god and god only it is the focus in which there is nothing else except god that is samadhi and it is the knowledge in which i realize i am brahman ekam eva advitiyam one only without a second all of these come from ananya very beautiful word no other in love no other except that in uh, thinking meditation no other except that one one reality that is samadhi actually and in knowledge gyana uh, no other brahman without a second advaita non dual so this bhakti you can understand as love you can understand as meditation you can understand as knowledge gyana yoga bhakti all are included in this so shankar is right in that way vivekananda so vivekananda was reading the inspired talks so one each sentence is so powerful a mantra it can take you to enlightenment he says this today i was reading he says we can never know god but we can be god knowledge is a lower state a degradation what does he mean by that he says we can never see our faces really in a mirror how interesting that example what a precise example we do see our faces but what we see is not the face itself uh, it's a uh, it's a nice copy of our faces it's second hand it's a reflection that's all that we can see when you see in a mirror and it depends on the mirror also whereas our face we are it but we don't we never see it then he, so, so this is from the knowledge perspective then he makes a very stunning statement about love same thing he says about love he says the truth is that we are love itself so we are sat chid anand all dry metaphysical things he puts it so beautifully no you are love 
but the only way we can experience it is by taking the help he call, he calls it he says by taking the help of a phantasm what is a phantasm a person something uh, an appearance a person a place a job a favorite food uh, your favorite pet dog a country a cause um, you know from the from a favorite cookie to a great thing like religion and nationalism and science and art whatever it is that we love and people especially so our understanding of love is that person is lovable and i love that person no that's a much lower understanding what you love is love itself how much do you know about that person how long will you have that person you never had that person earlier you will not have that person later husband wife children grandchildren father mother grandparents all come and go and even when they are there and you love them intensely how well do you really know them what you know is a phantasm little bit of what they really are mostly our own covering our own thinking imposed upon them and even what they really are the little bit you know is continuously changing is continuously changing <laughs> so uh, swami vivekananda stunning insight we are love itself but the thing is we the only way we can experience it is by catching hold of a phantasm that means holding on to a, some kind of object to love now the the person who understands this knows that what is truly valuable what is truly great is love itself what does it mean that i will not love the person i will just love love itself whatever that means no it means then that love itself is important so that love itself flows out unconditionally unconditionally freely openly without reserve to all persons all beings so you love all whatever whoever comes in front of you is because your very nature is to love it goes out there unconditionally So I'm Vivekananda said, "Greatest of all is to be enlightened and realize you are Brahman." He says, "Or if let all vision cease." He says, Vivekananda says, "Or if you cannot, then dream, but better dreams. If you still have to dream, then better uh, dream the best dream that you can." What is the best dream? He he spells that out also. He says, um, "Unconditional love." and service free so love without any condition everybody all the time everyone, internally at least and then actually what do you do service and free i give without asking for any my time energy my resources um, continuously flowing out because these are these are all uh, manifestation of maya or brahma uh, of of maya they will continuously flow better he says give give and do not look back whoever looks back his ocean dwindles to a drop so you keep on giving don't think it will ever be exhausted it won't be the more you give time energy love service your, your resources the more will flow through you it is absolutely sure in any case you don't need any of it for yourself you are the infinite brahman these are all the riches of maya the glory of maya let it flow the best use it is in service of those whom you love whom do you love everybody so uh, here he says ananyaya bhaktya and then yasya antasthani bhutani yena sarvam idam tatam how would you love all of them because all beings they dwell literally says in brahman see this universe appears to you all people universe everything appears to you step 1 step 2 it appears in you step 3 it is nothing but you all of this universe it exists or it appears in existence an ocean of existence in which all things appear that's why they seem to exist and there's nothing but that existence itself appearing as existing things just as all waves and bubbles and 
you know, the drops of water and foam and all. They're nothing but water itself appearing in all these waves. And where are they? It's not that there is water and on top of that there is a wave. The wave is nothing but water. It is in water and it is nothing but water. Similarly, this entire universe is appearing in Brahman and it's nothing but Brahman. It's appearing in you, the real you, and it's nothing but you. Where is this Brahman? Yena sarvamidam tatam. Sarvamidam. Here again, this very experience. Idam means here, 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 now. What you are right now, where you are sitting, the people you are around you. However crazy it may seem, all these people may seem crazy and unjust and unfair and miserable to you. They're none other than God. And they are, you say, I don't care. It's an awful God. Well, they are none other than you. They are your own reflection. They're literally you. I am, uh, you pervade in every bit of them. God dwells. You dwell in every bit of them. Every being which, who is around you. Sarvam idam, here. That's why I'm telling you the huge misunderstanding of Advaita Vedanta happens when you, you know, like a, uh, Brahman is real, Vedanta says, and this world is false. But when you say this world, what are you dismissing? You're dismissing Brahman itself. You're getting rid of God when you get rid of this world. Because here is, this is God is appearing in the form of this world. Everything in this world, every person, every being in this world is pervaded by the divine. So these are very glorious verses. Next, he will switch to that topic which I mentioned earlier. Uh, the pathway. Suppose one does not realize this right now in this life. Then what's open to us? So We are not going to go the miserable way of not being spiritual or religious at all. So there is the uh, the lower religious way of religious person, but still worldly, wants something in the world. That's one option. Religious person, spiritual person, wants nothing in this world, wants just God. Second option. And of course, the highest is becoming enlightened here and now itself. So he'll speak about two paths, the dark path and the, the light path or the illumined path. The dark path is where people are religious, are devotional, they believe in God, but they're still holding on to the world. So they'll come back to this world again. That's the dark path. And then the light path is, the path of light is uh, they want God realization, but somehow not yet enlightened. They will go to God. God will take care of them and give them enlightenment later. That is sequential enlightenment, krama mukti. And what he will not mention here, of course, in this chapter is uh, uh, the uh, jnana, the, the other one, which is to realize your identity with God here and now. You get freedom straight away. No path. Then there's no path path. Because you don't go anywhere anymore. And that is direct liberation here. All right. Let's quickly take a look at the questions. I don't think we'll have time to answer the questions today, but I'll just read out the questions at least. Bill says, isn't there a Gita verse that the third chapter category will be reborn in favorable circumstances? Continue there. Sadhana, yes. So there are some who are yogis who will be given an opportunity. So it's a spectrum. Um, there are those who do not come back into this world and remain in Brahma Loka. There are those who have not yet gone to that level, but will come back and do more sadhana and go to, to uh, Brahma Loka. Rodrigo says, what about the sincere Vedantins that do not hold ideas about a personal God but die unenlightened? Well, even if you don't hold ideas, uh, you'll be taken care of because God is all loving. God doesn't look at your particular uh, philosophy or what you are. As long as you want spirituality, as long as you want God realization, that's enough and God will take care of you. In the sixth chapter, Arjuna asked this question to Krishna. Krishna says, uh, whatever your state, as many were you started on the path of spirituality, your uh, hereafter will be good. Uh, at the very least, you can look forward to going to the heavens. But I have not done all those rituals and prayed for going to heaven. Well, you will still go to heaven and enjoy heaven like everybody else, those who, are, uh, those who wanted to go to heaven. And then you will come back. They will, the others, their, their karma will be exhausted. They will come back and again they will fall into samsara. You will come back. But you will not fall into samsara as such. You will be given an, uh, another opportunity to attain enlightenment in this life. Sixth chapter. At the end of sixth chapter. 
Krishna says this to Arjuna. Neela Vora says, um, Brahman and Maya seem similar to Purusha and Prakriti as in Sankhya philosophy. Absolutely. It's a very Purusha and Prakriti which becomes Brahman and Maya in, in uh, Vedanta. Of course, there are um, philosophers who will roll their eyes if they hear me saying this. There are major differences. For example, Purushas are many in Sankhya. In, uh, in Vedanta, Purusha, Brahman is one. Prakriti is separate from Purusha in um, uh, Sankhya. In Vedanta, Prakriti is Maya, the power of Purusha, power of Brahman. So these differences, big philosophical differences are there. But yes, in principle, it is exactly the same thing. Purusha Prakriti becomes Brahman Maya here. Patrick says, why is it Brahma Loka instead of Ishwara Loka? I thought Brahma. No, uh, this Brahma is uh, Saguna Brahman. Brahma Loka here is Saguna Brahman. Saguna Brahman is Ishwara. And it's interesting, even the Buddhists who don't have a concept of personal God, a creator God, they still have a pure land concept of a state of, you know, slightly below full enlightenment where highly advanced spiritual seekers will go and dwell. Hmm. Alpana says, isn't Maya experienced only, is Maya experience only by Maya, not by Brahman Atman? No, 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 no. Everything is experienced by Brahman Atman. You are Brahman Atman. Are you not experiencing the world? So ultimately, everything that happens and everything that is done, everything that is experienced is this Brahman Atman, but under multiple layers. It is mediated by Maya. It's because of Maya all of this is happening. Shiva Priya says, isn't the fourth level rebirth of Swami Turiyan and the Ishwar Koti monks Vivekananda came? Or incarnations can be considered from Brahma Loka. So that is not mentioned here. Um, but you are right. There might be another category who are fully liberated and yet choose to hold on to their individual existence to help humanity. They come once in a while. Imagine a Jeevan Mukta who doesn't die, suppose. So holds on to individual existence and yet knows is fully established in identity with Brahman. Such may be, there may be such people. I mean, Sri Ramakrishna says there are. Aditya says, should we take the existence of various heavens and hells as an article of faith? Is there a way to prove and rationalize the existence of such places in our cosmos? Heaven, hell is beyond the known cosmos. So the way we know about it is uh, from the Shastra. Just as, how do you know God exists? We are talking the 7th to 12th chapters. Notice one thing. In um, chapters 1 to 6, uh, we're talking about who am I, basically. And chapter 7 to 12, uh, we're talking about God. From 7 to 10, Krishna will give a very glorious description of God. And then what is Arjuna's reaction? He says, I want to see. I want to see. Why would he say that? He never said that for uh, the self. In the first six chapters, he didn't want to say, he didn't say, I want to see this self. He knows he exists. It has to be realized. It has to be realized through self-inquiry and spiritual practices. But God, when he uh, hears about it from Krishna, well, he has heard about it. He tells Krishna, I believe you, but I would like to see it. Because it's not really part of our experience right now. Unless you are Sri Ramakrishna having a continuous experience of Kali, we, we generally don't have an experience of God we, we read about it, we believe in it, we sort of even may feel a kind of divine presence that much. We don't have a direct experience of God as we are having an experience of ourselves or this world. Uh, so, Saguna Brahman is an article of faith. Similarly, heaven is an article of faith. So, that's why those who have a problem with all of this, Ramana Maharshi would say, find out who am I. Kalpana is saying, why are we asked to see or understand Mithyatva of Jagat? Oh, big question. So I think somebody, uh, uh, somewhere I gave the answer to this question. You will find they have made a little video out of it, our IT team. Why should we take the world as false? There is a video, this is uploaded recently. If you go to our YouTube channel, you will see.
Girisha. So how and why does existence appear as existing things? That's the very nature of existence. It is, and if it didn't, you know, you could accuse existence. What good are you? Your existence, but nothing exists. So existence immediately hurries up and uh, appears as things existing. If no things existed, you say, what good is existence? There's nothing. No thing. So you want some things to exist. Tables, chairs, people, good and bad. So existence obliges and comes forth as this word, <laughs> existing word. And then when we suffer and we say, oh, why did it happen? You ask for it. Uh, your question is, why does existence appear as existing things? What are the options? Two options. It could appear as existing things as this universe or it could not. It may, need not. It could just remain as pure existence without any existing thing at all. And that's what existence does. When there is the universe, Srishti, Stiti, existence uh, is existing as existing things. When there is Pralaya, the entire universe is absorbed back into the Maya of Brahman. Existence uh, exists as existence itself without any existing things. So from manifest to unmanifest. When it becomes manifest, we say things are existing. Here is a universe. When it becomes unmanifest, it seems to be nothing. But Brahman is still there. Michael Bird says, similar to how my reflection of face is just a copy of the real thing, not to be confused with the real face, is the object of my love, a romantic partner, also a reflection of true love, not to be confused with real love, uh, aka Brahman. It's a limitation of real love. That's why it is a source of pain and suffering also. It's a source of, source of pleasure and joy because love is always, it gives joy. But then why does love give pain and suffering? Romantic partner, children, um, you know, any, anything that, that, you, that you love. It could be a cause. It could be, you know, like a nation or an organization or something. Whatever limited thing you love will be a source of pain. Masharada put it very nicely. And she said, uh, so he, she says love God if you love a person as a human being there, is, there will be suffering there will be happiness also if you love there will be happiness but there will also be suffering because the human aspect comes into play there and that's a phantasm we are holding on to something that's not really real um, so object of my love a reflection of true love your love uh, for the object of your love, the person of your love, that's a reflection of true love. And you're using the object of your love as a way of manifesting that true love. But if you know what true love is and you know that you are love itself, it will manifest towards everybody, including the present object of your love. It will manifest towards everybody. And it will not be limited. And it will not be subject to increase and decrease. Not be subject to coming and going. Not be subject to strain and frustration and uh, unhappiness and misery. Jennifer says, is consciousness the same as unmanifest Maya? No. Maya is unmanifest and it becomes manifest as this universe. And consciousness is the reality behind it. Consci consciousness is chit or sat. That which gives substance and reality to Maya itself. Without which Maya couldn't exist. Think about all the pictures and sounds and all in a movie. And there is the background, the screen. So the background, the screen is not the pictures. But the pictures and the sound in the movie itself couldn't exist without that background. The background is the solid rock upon which the movie plays. And all movies play. Okay. Uh, Dimitri has raised his hand. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Yes. Uh, good evening, Swamiji. Uh, Swamiji, uh, like, could you please correct my understanding here if I'm not quite getting this? The final stage, uh, the Jivan Mukta, then merging into Brahman. This is like a final death, right? Like a final liberation, because there is no self in, in the final, which is also the beginning and the middle and the end of all. Therefore, uh, e the experience itself is part of Maya, and beyond it, there is no experience. So, is Ishwara also a permanent entity? Is or, Ishwara also? A... Uh, is Ishwara a permanent entity, or it also goes through the cycles of 
no ishwara does not go through the cycles it's um, ishwara's power which is maya goes through these cycles it expands and contracts it manifests and becomes unmanifest again just as you really do not go through uh, waking dreaming and deep sleep it's the mind which provides you the experience of waking dreaming and deep sleep you illumine all regardless similarly ishwara is one constant shining uh, consciousness and ishwara is ever liberated uh, ishwara has a sense of uh, i so uh, i i am the lord of all i am god that that sense is there that and that's the, because of maya yeah so it doesn't mean that in the final stage we are sort of like uh i'm i'm running out of language to express myself uh, that's here. good that means you are on the right track uh, <laughs> if you have a sense for the for the truth as it is you will find it difficult to encompass in language so but th- does it mean that in the final stage we are sort of we will be able to co- like the consciousness itself the brahman comprehends himself through ishvara and that is uh, the final resting point for each mm not even final when we break out of this we'll see this whole sequence of uh, ignorance then seeking liberation becoming liberated that also is not real that was also within maya mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that's it <laughs> there's nothing more to be said beyond that okay. yeah. not that it will be a blankness remember take the example of a liber- person who's liberated so all experiences are still continuing just that the person knows for the first time what the truth is and so and that sets him free so it's brahman is perfectly compatible with experience with the universe with things when they exist brahman is perfectly compatible with the existing universe with life with experience brahman is perfectly compatible with the dissolution of all physical mental um, in all kinds of existences existing things and just brahman exists with the power of maya brahman is perfectly compatible with that also Brahman is perfectly compatible with something and with nothing. Only that not, nothing is a potential form of that something. It's not literally nothing. But there is no self in that, right? Like there is no like the sense of I. The sense, It, reflexive it, sense of I will come into being uh, when there is a, a mind which can uh, reflect upon it. So for example, our own waking, dreaming, deep sleep, see, um, you know, even in deep sleep, there's no sense of self. that sense of self kicks in the moment we start dreaming or we wake up yeah all right um alpana you wanted to ask something or you've already asked to unmute yourself to unmute can you unmute yeah yes uh- Nam Swami Ji, no, and, and, and that's why my question was, isn't Maya experienced by Maya? Because it is the mind or the eyes or the instruments that are experiencing. You are just an illuminator of all of that. So isn't it? Yes. The- now, now, careful here. Suppose you as the illuminator were not there, would the instruments go on experiencing? Perfectly no, fine. No, no, no. Never. Mm-hmm. They would never go on experiencing. That's right. So, so who experiences? it is you under the limitation of those instruments or you equipped with those instruments you become the bhokta the experiencer but uh, in reality you are not yes that's the point that in reality You're, you are in you reality you are not you are ever free of that but without you no experiencer exists that's it's like who illumines the world at night moonlight but the, is the moonlight independent of sunlight no 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 in one sense it is the sunlight but if you ask the sun why are you illuminating why is the light more to, in the, to tonight why is the light less tonight the sun will say i have nothing to do with it i shine and that the fellow that in your little world there is a little uh, in the sky there is a little fellow called the moon and it um, you know goes through phases and that's why you're getting more light and less light and you know full moon and new moon and all of that i have nothing to do i am shining absolutely exactly the same for millions and billions of years and not literally the same sun also goes through phases but little bit of changes are there but but you see what i mean you are like the sun all right let's end here om shanti 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 hari om tat sat
ಶ್ರೀರಾಮಕೃಷ್ಣಾರ್ಪಣಮಸ್ತು